Hello everyone and welcome to the School of Taste. Welcome back if you are a returning webinar attendee and if this is your first webinar, live webinar with me, you're very welcome. And especially welcome if you are watching on recording. Uh, I know it's not always possible to attend live, so thank you for uh, taking the time to watch the recording. Um, this is our third uh, session in um, this series of webinars about major international varieties and how they express themselves differently when planted in different regions around the world. Um, we have looked at so far uh, Chardonnay and Cabernet and now we're going to move on to um, a variety which for some of us I don't think we give enough credit to for how interesting and diverse it can be when planted in different regions. But I think hopefully by the end of this webinar, we'll have realized that Sauvignon Blanc is in fact one of the great white varieties capable of many different expressions when planted around the world. Uh, as ever in this webinar, please do use the questions function uh, to ask any questions you might have of me or indeed to submit any comments about the wines that you are tasting. Uh, without further ado, let's move on to our first slide here. So again, this is uh, simply uh, a repetition of the same slide that we saw at the beginning of the previous two weeks sessions. Um, but just a reminder about what we're going to be looking for uh, during today's uh, webinar. Both what are characteristics of the variety of Sauvignon Blanc? And how does um, the place, the region in which it is grown uh, wine by wine, how does that express itself in the glass? How do we understand it? Uh, how can we experience the place through the grape variety? Um, I've also drawn this distinction, which is going to be more relevant in this session um, than in previous sessions, this distinction between um, region and country. My argument always is that within individual countries, there are general winemaking styles, which are the result of climate, uh, but also of winemaking choice or just national styles. So that's all fine. But in this session, we're going to have the ability to look at one country, but two different regions within it. So that will give us the opportunity really to think about the way not just the country is reflected in the wine and the glass, but also region, how the different regions and the different climates within a country can find expression through the great variety. Um, so climate, as I mentioned, is always going to be a primary consideration. Um, and there is just some other factors at the bottom of this slide that you might want to think about also as you're tasting the wines today. But we should start, I suppose, with um, uh, a basic 101 Sauvignon Blanc, uh, what we should expect from a typical Sauvignon Blanc. Um, clearly Sauvignon is an aromatic variety. That is the first uh, and most important point, I think, to make about Sauvignon Blanc. Um, it is simply a variety which depends very heavily for its attractions on its ar aromatics. It's got a, usually a wonderful fruity perfume, and I hope we're going to see that in the wines today. Um, after that, uh, often only a light to medium bodied variety, um, especially if it's not blended, um, uh, not a sort of heavyweight variety usually. Um, and in terms of acidity, many of you who taste with me regularly know that I'm very interested by acid and acid structure in white wines. Um, what we always find, I believe, in Sauvignon Blanc is initially you get a big hit of quite uh, zesty acidity felt on the tongue. But after a few seconds of holding the wine in your mouth, it really seems to move around the edges of the mouth to create this sense of a kind of spherical acidity in the mouth as if you are holding a ball of acidity in the mouth and you just feel this kind of electric energy of acidity right around the edges of the mouth. I think that's very, uh, very traditional Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and we know, of course, as we will talk about later in the session, Sauvignon Blanc can also be uh, blended uh, with other varieties, usually Sauvignon, but we'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, so please do ask any questions you have using the questions function. But while you're thinking about that, um, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't pour the first wine, the uh, first Sauvignon Blanc from France, the example from the Loire Valley. OK, so let me just uh, move my slide forward. Yep. OK. Now. Uh, 
Abigail is asking a question about what I was just commenting about the spherical uh, acid structure of Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, when I say, uh, you know, things like uh, Chardonnay has got a linear acid structure or Sauvignon Blanc has got a spherical acid structure, what I mean is the variety has that, irrespective of where it's grown or whether it's oaked or whether it's blended or whether it's sweet or sparkling or dry or anything else, the acid structure has that fundamental shape to the acidity. That's my argument. Um, for those of you who don't know, I argue this at great length in my book called Beyond Flavor. Uh, I recommend uh, you to take a look at that. But yeah, so irrespective of the origin, um, the I believe the variety still maintains that uh, sense of uh, architecture in the case of Sauvignon Blanc around the edge of the mouth in terms of acid structure. Okay, so um, why don't you guys tell me um, what aromas and flavors you are getting from your Loire Sauvignon Blanc. And as you do that, also please tell me which uh, region it comes from, whether it's uh, Sancerre or Puy-Fumé or some other region in the Loire Valley, um, just so I have some context for your comments. And then we'll move on to a few more of the details here uh, on the slide, but just aromas and flavors first. Okay, so a lot of uh, aromatic notes people are talking about, and um, I can uh, definitely see that. Yvonne is saying uh, grapefruit, grass, white flowers, uh, in her example of Sancerre, which sounds about right to me. Uh, Abigail is saying also for Sancerre, citrus, peach, apricot, apple blossom, good. Uh, Corey is saying green pepper, and grapefruit. Grapefruit is quite a, a common note, it seems. Um, for Nupa, stone fruit, mineral, chalk, so maybe chalky mineral, uh, citrus, very good. Um, and Dennis has got similar notes, uh, grapefruit and mineral, uh, but also some gooseberry and glass and grass, excuse me. Uh, TJ, another song there, red grapefruit, good, I like that, kind of a riper style of grapefruit perhaps. Uh, floral, lemon pith, Yes, excellent. Uh, fleur, gooseberries for Puy Fume now uh, with a chalky texture. Um, Tufi is also more in the gooseberry cut grass asparagus uh, for uh, his Sancerre. Very good. Um, yeah, excellent. So obviously you've got some good classic examples. <clears throat> uh, most of you seem to have got Sancerre or Puy Fume. Um, now I just want to talk a little bit through this um, slide. The first thing. Um, I was just going to mention is that Sancerre and Puy Fume clearly are the famous uh, appellations, um, but I do think there are many uh, outlying appellations in the Loire Valley which are making very consistent and often pretty good value examples of Sauvignon Blanc, like Cancy and Rilly, and even ones which are just labelled things like Val de Loire can be very, very nice value as well. Um, I think that Sancerre especially is getting quite a premium just for the name now. Uh, and if you're, for instance, if you're a sommelier, then um, it may be, Sancerre may be sort of pushing it in terms of price now, especially if you're in the US where it's 25% more expensive than it was a year ago, um, whether you want to have that by the glass, but you could, for instance, have another one of these slightly outlying appellations. You could sell it, you know, for $10 a glass when it would give a very, very good impression of being Sancerre for a lot less money. So, um, so don't overlook the outlying regions is my overall point. Um, you can see under France qualities, um, again, I have not changed um, that description from when we were talking about Cabernet Sauvignon last week or Chardonnay the week before. Um, the reason is that if my theories are right, there are sort of national conventions or stereotypes in wine making styles or wine styles in countries, then it shouldn't matter what the variety is. So um, you can see what I'm arguing are French qualities. And uh, you can also see um, what I've suggested here for Loire Sauvignon Blanc. Um, now, as we're looking at that, why don't you guys tell me a little bit about the style of the wine that you have? Um, so we're thinking about things like body weight, about how aromatic a style it is. Uh, we're thinking about levels of acidity. Um, 
also more generally whether we think that this is a wine about fruit 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 is really a focal point or whether it's really more savory or perhaps more uh, mineral or some combination of those uh, whether you have uh, oak any kind of sense of vanilla or spice or uh, smokiness on your wine which would indicate the use of oak um, tell me a little bit about the style of your wine because um, this is a really i think getting to the heart of what um, loire valley sauvignon blanc can be about um, very good uh, fleur is mentioning uh, a region which i didn't just mention touraine uh, Turin, that's another example to go along with the ones I just mentioned, which can be a, a great source of uh, of Loire uh, Sauvignon for a very fair price. Um, uh, Fleur is asking that Turin has been move, moving closer to New Zealand um, in style. Uh, is that fair? Well, let's just come on to that in just a sec, um, Fleur, because I think that's a very uh, important question. Okay, so Maria is saying that for her Sancerre, uh, uh, she's going with mineral and savory, no oak and dry. Good. Um, I like those terms because they're very specific, um, straight to the point, um, very useful. So thank you for that, Maria. Um, Dennis commenting, uh, pronounced aromatics, high prickly acidity, concentrated flavors, medium body and moderate alcohol, balanced and well integrated. Good. I think that's a good description, Dennis. Um, TJ is drawing an interesting distinction between the nose being fruity and floral, but the palate being dry and lean and it ends on a savory note. So that's quite interesting, almost a, um, a contrast between the fruity nose and the, the dry finish. Um, good note there from TJ. Um, Tufi is saying uh, pale in color. Yeah, thanks for the note about the color, Tufi. I think, by the way, uh, everyone, I don't know whether you agree with me, but I think Sauvignon Blanc can be one of the palest color wines. Um, hopefully you guys have got some kind of concentration of fruit uh, you can feel on the tongue. If that is so, then the yields should be reasonably well managed. But if you have very high yields, you can get very, very, very pale colored um, uh, Sauvignon Blanc for sure. Uh, green, mineral, high crispicity, and a medium minus body. Good. Uh, Anthony saying the pre fume has delicate stone fruit aromas, more delicate than I would have expected. Um, the herbaceous quality more evident on the palate than the nose. Yeah, interesting. Um, Jessica is commenting that the Hersons hair shows no new oak, but was aged in old barrels with lees. Um, savory, salty, mineral. And video just making the comment that her wine is well integrated. Good. Um, so I think um, you guys uh, are, are on the right track. And what is also really good in, um, about your notes is they're very consistent with each other. Um, I, there's no sort of uh, raving uh, contradictions in the way that you're assessing the wines, which is um, good because it gives us some confidence that we can make some uh, reasonable um, summing up statements about the characteristics of Loire Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I think if you look under the, the, the bullet point here, the third bullet point, Sauvignon Blanc qualities, light to medium bodies, seems like most of you um, agree with that. Um, no new oak. I mean, just because, again, I think um, in Sauvignon Blanc, because you're in aromatic wine territory, you don't want to have any flavors or aromas which are going to get in the way of experiencing that um, intense aromatic uh, fruitiness. Um, that's the risk of, of oak notes. Uh, and also, I think that in this kind of style, which comes from relatively far north in France, the crispness of the acidity, which many of you have commented on, might also be affected if, um, if new oak especially was used, which tends, in my experience, to soften out the edges of the wine. So oak aging, to my mind, can give more than just flavors but it can also soften a wine because um in contrast to say stainless steel aging um there's a, a a small amount of oxygen ingress when you're aging a wine in oak even in old oak but especially in new oak and that little uh presence of oxygen is just going to soften the edges of the wine which in many white wines and in many red wines especially is fantastic it's what you want it's what tames the tannins or perhaps the more aggressive youthful notes 
But in Sauvignon Blanc from Droit, I think you want to preserve all the, uh, the crisp acidity and the high toned uh, aromas, uh, which are such a defining features of the style. So I think that's probably why you don't see many examples with new oak. Um, yeah, and the aromatic um, emphasis, of course, um, I think is, uh, I think is uh, very obvious. Um, I note that, and you can, uh, we can talk about this later, but I note the emphasis on aromatics just because um, you might say, well, that's an obvious point, you know, it's Sauvignon Blanc, but let's ask that question again when we're tasting, um, for instance, uh, Bordeaux next. Um, or perhaps a Californian example, um, then you might see a bit of contrast to that. So I still think, even though it's obvious, it's a point worth, worth making. Um, so uh, some people are talking about a Lee's contact. So Lee's being the dead yeast cells. So whatever the vessel you're aging the wine in after um, alcoholic fermentation, whether it's stainless steel or some kind of wood, then you can have some um, contact with the Lee's. Um, and that tends to me to give a more mid palate texture. Some people say like a soapy texture, some people say like a creamy texture, but to me, the main point is that it stands in quite sharp contrast to that very zesty, almost prickly acidity. It's soft, um, it's a soft, uh, easy going texture as opposed to the sort of somewhat abrasive acidity, which is so typical of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, uh, so lees are, are a texture, but as Anthony is mentioning, lees can also contribute a bit to body weight as well. Um, that's why I think a wine like Muscadet, to stay in the Loire Valley for a moment, a wine like Muscadet, which can be one of the lightest wines out there, um, has to be aged on the lees uh, if you want any kind of body at all. Uh, if you want to have any mid palate concentration, uh, a lees aging just adds a bit of texture there. And I think that what might be what some of you are experiencing also uh, here. Um, okay. Lydia is asking um, a question about the last two bullet points. So let's address those now. <clears throat> so my whole, um, <laughs> my sort of somewhat uh, controversial opinion is that most of the wine textbooks have not really caught up with where we are at with Sancerre and Puy Fume today in terms of the descriptions of them. Um, many old wine textbooks will tell you that Sancerre is the real gooseberry wine, uh, very herbaceous, green, cut grass, gooseberry, um, all those notes which are redolent slightly of under-ripeness. I don't find that really in most Sancerres today. I don't know whether it's um, uh, climate change, I don't know whether it's winemaking decisions, um, I don't know whether to go back to someone's comment earlier is because uh, winemakers in Sancerre are trying to imitate the extremely successful world beating New Zealand style. But whatever the reason, I think Sancerre now has got, has got a very, um, has got a very pure perfume which leaps out the glass, but it's not a green perfume to me. So high toned, what does high toned mean? High toned means that it's all it's kind of airy and lifted and bright. It's pouring out of the of the of the glass. Um, that's what high toned means. It's not heavy or dead or ponderous. Uh, it's very lifted and full of life, and it just bursts out of the glass. Uh, high toned aromas um, and the pronounced perfume. So that to me, so Son said to me is often more on um, some kind of floral notes. Um, that's what I think I'm talking about with high toned. Whereas Puy Fume, again, I think the textbooks are wrong because they always, you know, as the name suggests, Fume, smoky. I don't, again, I don't really get that. Um, I get, to me, the difference between Sanse and Puy Fume is that Puy Fume is the wine with evident fruit, uh, green fruits on the nose, as opposed to the floral florality of Sanse. It's got these little green fruits, not just gooseberry but also other other uh, citrus notes and things like that um, so that would be an example of where the aromas are not so high toned as in Sancerre it hasn't got the floral perfume of Sancerre it's a bit more uh, purely a, about those green fruits and then in contrast to the smokiness which I don't really like I prefer it's more like slaty or flinty some kind of rocky sensation in, in Puy Fume again um, I hesitate to get too far into these distinctions because um, 
as you know, I'm much more interested in wine structure. Um, but just because I do think that sometimes we are led astray by the classic uh, descriptions of these two uh, regions, um, I want just to mention those two points. And it, it is interesting. They are classic examples of terroir, which are very close to each other, which have got the same variety, um, but are somewhat different styles. But all of this is complicated by other factors as well, not least the fact that there are a number of different soil types in uh, in the region. So um, that's also going to have an influence on the on the final wine. Um, uh, Venkat, I think I already answered your question. By more understated, do you mean less high toned? Exactly. So understated is on one side and high toned is on the other side. Um, but more about aromas, I think, than about acidity. I think the acidity between the two regions is really at the same level. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Anthony's saying he doesn't find so many um, green notes in um, Sancerre and Puy Fume these days as in, as in the past. I completely agree with that. It could be yield management as well. Uh, you know, when if you reduce yields, you get a bit more concentration and generally you lose those green aromas, whether in a white wine or a red wine. But my guess is that uh, climate change has got a lot to do with this as well. Um, just warmer, uh, warmer growing seasons um, just create a slightly riper sensation all around. OK, any uh, questions uh, before we move on about uh, Loire um, uh, Sauvignon Blanc? I do think that it's a great place to start it, it, as an introduction 101 to Sauvignon Blanc. If I was trying to explain what Sauvignon Blanc was to uh, to anyone, I would definitely start with Loire Valley, which is also very helpful for us because it's really you know, the coolest region. So generally in this class, as in the others, we're going to move from cooler to warmer climate. And um, I do think that this is, uh, this is the coolest place that can really successfully grow um, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I would uh, urge you, if you are invested in Sauvignon Blanc, also to look at uh, San Brie, which as you guys know, is near Chablis, a small region near Chablis, but which is turning out very nice, chalky Sauvignon Blancs, uh, delightful wines. Um, I think uh, Tooth is just asking what's the distinction between these wines, Sancerre and Puy-Fumé, and those ones a bit further down uh, the Loire towards the sea. Uh, because, by the way, if any of you guys have not been to Sancerre or Puy-Fumé or couldn't even pick them out on the map, um, then they're not where you think they are. Um, I thought for a long time they were sort of in the middle of the Loire. In fact, if you get a map of France and put your finger right smack bang in the middle of it, you're going to be pretty close to Sancerre and Puy-Fumé. These uh, regions are only a few hours from Chablis, just as they are a few hours from the sea. So very much in the middle of France. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I just think that these uh, these wines from this region uh, out here um, are much more, they're much more everything. They're more integrated. They've got more high-toned aromatics. They're more complex. Um, if you've ever forgot a bottle of uh, Sancerre in your cellar, you'll know that it can actually age quite nicely. Um, whereas I don't think the ones in the middle of the Loire, like in Touraine, they're very nice wines when they're young, but um, perhaps lack the concentration for um, additional development or further complexity with age. Okay, so why don't we move on to uh, Bordeaux. Um, so we're going to stay in France, of course. Um, this uh, a prize, by the way, to anyone who uh, anyone who knows Bordeaux well enough to know whose dogs those are. And as a result, which chateau this photograph was taken at one of the great exponents, in fact, of Sauvignon Blanc in Bordeaux. Um, the, uh, I visit the chateau every year during normal years to taste the wine on Primo, not this year, of course, but um, uh, always a pleasure to visit this property because they make wonderful red wines and wonderful uh, white wines. So um, it's not quite such a consistent assault on the palate as just tasting big, Cabernet wines, one after another, after another. Um, okay. Um, Abigail is just mentioning Sauvignon Blanc doesn't age that well because it becomes vegetal. Well, Abigail, it depends what you like. Um, Vatan, for instance, which is the most expensive producer, I think, of, uh, of these wines, um, it becomes intensely vegetal, but some wine lovers go crazy for that and they'll pay a lot of money for that experience. Uh, I had an 06 or an 07, uh, was it this year? This year, maybe last year. And uh, it was, as you say, it was very vegetal. 
um, a bit too much for my taste, but we were in the wine bar in New York and everyone was going crazy for it, apart from me. So go figure. Um, Rudolfo is wondering whether this is Chateau Smith Oak Lafitte. Not Smith Oak Lafitte, but very close in the same uh, region. This is in um, also in Pessac Les Oignons. This is at Domaine de Chevalier, uh, which is a wonderful uh, producer, both of red and white uh, Bordeaux, of course. Um, okay, so why don't we talk aromas and flavors in your uh, Bordeaux Blanc? Um, you can tell me what you're getting and also tell me exactly where your wine comes from, whether it's uh, Grave or Entre de Mer or Pessac Léonion, like the dogs come from. So they belong to the Bernard family, who are one of the nicest families in, uh, in Bordeaux and making some of the most consistently good wines for fair prices. Uh, always a pleasure to be at Domaine de Okay, let's see what you guys are getting. Rodolfo agrees about Domaine de Chevalier. Okay, so uh, Tufi um, has got a um, dry sauterne, which is fascinating because I think that this is um, this is a region where they're going to have to be a bit innovative about how to sell all their wines because of the limited demand, unfortunately, for the great sweet wines of Bordeaux in sauterne. Um, but I think that Gilles de Giro, um, the dry wine of Chateau Giro in sauterne, um, is certainly one of the more successful examples of dry white sauterne. Of course, it's not called sauterne because sauterne has to be sweet, so it's just going to be Bordeaux Blanc. Um, but Tufi is saying 70% of Sauvignon Blanc in the G de Giro. Um, aromatic, savory, Tufi says, good. And Fleur has got a grave um, with more tropical fruits, pineapple, creamy, and cinnamon spices. So already we're in a different world to the uh, Loire by the sounds of it. Uh, Maria is commenting on her Pessac, herbaceous but new French oak. Good. Uh, Neil um, Chateau Clark, toasty, grassy, um, quince. Good. Quince, that kind of tart uh, fruit. Good. Um, Jessica, grass, hay, lemon zest. Even lemon zest, I, I feel like, can be a bit riper sometimes, somehow, in flavor profile to some of the Loire's. Um, Yvonne. Uh, another grave with white peaches, lemon, nettles, very slight vanilla spice. I'm actually quite jealous of Yvonne tasting a 2019 uh, Bordeaux Blanc because, of course, 2019 is what people like me would have been tasting if we'd been able to go to Bordeaux in the spring. Um, and so I really haven't tasted any uh, 2019s yet. Um, so it's interesting to see what it's like. I think 2019 is clearly a warm vintage. So if you guys have got uh, bottles of 2019 or indeed 2018, another warm vintage, then I certainly expect good ripeness of fruit. Uh, Tufi saying that even on his dry example, he's getting some botrytis notes, which is interesting. Um, Corey has got Andre de Mer and is complaining that it's quite a simple wine. Well, Corey, you are in Andre de Mer. You could have forked out Pesac de Ognon, really. Dennis, um, Riper fruit, orange peel, slightly oily. Good note, Dennis. Oily, uh, a bit of oiliness in that example. Um, I don't think you guys tell me otherwise, but I don't think anyone will have likely experienced any oiliness in the Loire example. So that's a, an interesting point there. Um, less lifted, Dennis says, so less aromatic mineral, uh, more savory stone fruits, citrus, grapefruit, balanced, interesting, complex. Uh, sounds excellent. Sounds delicious wine, Dennis. TJ. Um, very flinty, lemon, fresh herb, um, vidya, more stone fruit. So again, we've got quite a few uh, notes of stone fruit. Grapefruit was a very consistent note in the uh, Loire's, but stone fruit, um, we're getting a lot here. Um, Nupa in Pesac Réunion with uh, peach, again, savory asparagus and vanilla. Um, Anthony from Barzac. So this is going to be another dry example from a sweet wine producing region. A riper lemon, red apple, rosemary and quince, good. Um, Abigail saying still dry, um, but a little sweeter on the palate than the Loire example, good. Uh, more body than before, um, long warm finish, good. Um, 
and uh, video is also adding that the, everything's well integrated um, into the medium body. Um, peaches, orange peel, oily and complex for Luciana. Uh, Rodolfo, flinty, smoky, oily. Yeah, very good, excellent. Um, okay, so um, let's just see whether we can just talk about the first couple of bullet points here. Um, just in terms of context, uh, in Bordeaux, generally speaking, although not always, um, Sauvignon Blanc is blended with the Semillon. Um, Semillon tends to give um, mid palate fruit, so a bit of additional weight right there on the tongue. We uh, talked in the beginning about how the spherical acidity of Sauvignon Blanc can feel as if it's pushing everything to the edge of the mouth. So Semillon uh, can add a bit of content to the middle. And if you guys are thinking, well, that sounds reminiscent of another Bordeaux variety, Cabernet Sauvignon, then you're exactly right. Cabernet Sauvignon, the tannins are around the edge and they can uh, appear to leave a hole of fruit in the middle of the tongue, which is why many winemakers blend with Merlot. The guess which variety is the parent of Cabernet Sauvignon? Yeah, Sauvignon Blanc. So uh, maybe I'm stretching here, but it's just quite interesting that both Cabernet and uh, Sauvignon Blanc um, are really felt, especially around the edges of the mouth, and uh, they're blended with varieties which contribute a bit more mid palate. So that's kind of interesting. So in dry white wines, the kind of wines that you have in front of you, generally Sauvignon Blanc takes the lead, but it's the reverse in the sweet wines of Bordeaux. Generally there, there's more uh, Semillon. Um, okay, so now let's just talk a little bit about style, the style of your wine. What are you gonna go with? Again, we're talking here about sweet or savory or dry or aromatic, or um, some of you have already said some uh, great notes, but uh, if you'd like to add anything, then please, please. Uh, take the opportunity now. My one is uh, actually from Chateau Puy Garou, which is over there on the right bank of Bordeaux, made by the Tiempon family, which um, own and manage a lot of uh, good properties on the right bank. And um, I don't know how much it was, $22, maybe $24. And um, I spent a lot of my, my life tasting Bordeaux. It's what I did for a long time uh, when I was working in my old job. Um, so usually, actually, I must admit, I don't buy white Bordeaux just because I feel like I know it so well. But when I opened this last night, I, I was very I was very pleased. It's just a delicious, delightful wine. It's, it's very uh, aromatic. And for that price, there's actually quite a lot of complexity. So um, I was, uh, even I uh, can be surprised. Okay. Um, Michelle is saying dry with savory oak, um, oak aged um, complex wine. Good. Um, <laughs> Luciana is making a comment. I was just talking about the Sauvignon Blanc and the Cabernet being sort of focused around the edge of the mouth. And Luciana is saying, I have to taste both uh, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc in a black glass. Yeah, you should do it. That would be uh, that would be fun. Just especially if you put a put like a peg over your nose, so you can't smell anything. And just do everything purely on uh, structure. That would be super cool. If any of you, uh, any master of wine students out there, that's a great thing to do as well. Um, that's why I, I did for the exam. You either you 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 put a peg over your nose, and or you serve the white wines right out of the fridge as cold as possible. So either way, you can't smell anything. So you cannot rely on flavors. And you just have to rely on structure. It's a very uh, instructive uh, process. Jessica's um, dry sauteur is very restrained, savory, zesty, firm. I mean, again, just think the fact we're using the word restrained in the context of Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, what a world away we are here from uh, the Loire. Um, Tufi is saying uh, for his dry sauteur, um, intense peach honey, um, vanilla, so probably oak notes, with high crisp acidity, a medium body, and a savory, complex, long finish. A lot of you guys are commenting on the finish of the wine, um, and a lot of you are mentioning the word complex or complexity. And um, I wonder whether you're, in particular, you're picking up on the complexity on the finish after you've spat or after you've swallowed. Um, Dennis is commenting, that it seems slightly phenolic around the edge, um, a little bit chewy around the edge, a bit like having tannins in a red wine, 
uh, is that acid or oak tannin? Well, uh, it could be acid, it could be oak tannin, or it could be phenolics from the skins of the grapes. Um, all three have got a good chance of being in there, especially if you have any semillon in your blend, which can be quite um, a chewy variety um, for sure. Uh, Neil, uh, savory, darker flavor compared to the brighter Sancerre. Good, I like that comparison, darker as opposed to the lighter Sancerre. Anthony, um, high intensity aromatics, complemented by ripe fruit uh, and herbs, round, smooth, and mouth coating on the palate. Yeah, there's a bit more body as well. I mean, this is, I think, a big uh, a distinction from the Loire, and not just in terms of this wine may be more medium bodied or even close close to full bodied in some uh, premium examples, but there's more than just that. There's also additional texture. So when Anthony says smooth and mouth coating, to me, those are textural terms. And we talked a little bit about uh, Lee's aging for the uh, Loire Sauvignon Blanc. But here, I think it's the Semillon. I think it's the Oak, if there is any on your example. I think it's the Lee's aging, all of which contribute a bit more texture than we were getting in the Loire Valley. Um, okay, so let me just see any points we have missed on this slide. Um, once again, I think in terms of the France qualities, balance, dryness, balance, I don't think anything is sticking out in your wine, right? It's not in mine. Dryness, um, look, look at the finish. Is your wine fruity on the finish or is it dry? I think a few people have coated, uh, have commented on how dry the finish of the wine is. The firm structure, that's about the acidity. I think we can see that. And the moderate alcohols. Some white Bordeaux, premium white Bordeaux, like for instance, the one in the picture, Domaine de Chevalier, or Smith Oak Lafitte, or Pavillon Blanc, ones you know, which are over $100 a bottle they can have elevated levels of alcohol, definitely, in ripe vintages, 14% is not unusual. Um, but I still think they managed to retain their, their balance just because they're full-bodied wines uh, in general. So the alcohol level is balanced by the concentration. Um, ben Cat is asking, is Lee's aging for Sauvignon common in Bordeaux? I think Lee's aging is common um, for uh, Sauvignon in Bordeaux, absolutely. I think really, you know, a good analog for Bordeaux winemaking is Burgundy white winemaking, actually, if you think about it, because in the premium examples, again, if your wine costs $20, it's probably not going to have seen small oak aging because oak barrels are expensive, right? But if you've got a more uh, premium example, a Grand Cru Class A from Pessac Leonion or somewhere, um, then those wines almost will always be aged in small French barriques, um, 225 liters, um, and when you age wine like that, then you almost always include the lees as well, at least before the first racking, for sure. So yeah, I think very common. Um, okay, and then let me just see whether I missed anything here on Bordeaux Sauvignon Blanc qualities. Medium bodies, yep. Of course, you do get lighter examples from places like Entre de Mer, which can be very, very light and more Sauvignon from Loire style. Um, but in general terms, if it's got any amount of semi on it, if it's got any amount of oak in it, then it's gonna be a bit more full bodied. And in the premium examples, as I was just mentioning, for sure you can get full bodied uh, wines. Uh, semi on oak, we talked about, I think you can all see in general that we've moved 100, uh, what is it, 100, 150 miles further south. And even that little bit of uh, distance has uh, resulted in additional ripeness to the fruit here, simply put additionally ripe. The harvest dates are very similar, beginning of September. Um, but the fruit is just riper here, um, which means the transition from the green notes to the, the riper stone fruit notes that a lot of you recognized. Um, less emphasis on aromatics. So um, we talked in the Loire just about how the aromas are such a dominant feature of Sancerre and Puy Fumé. Here I don't think that, um, here I think that there's a lot more going on, so the winemakers don't feel the need to bring out those aromatics so much. Um, the texture is, is good, the body is a bit fuller, the finish can be longer, there can be additional complexity here, given not least by the additional ripeness, all of which means that, of course, you can uh, have very aromatic wines, it's still Sauvignon Blanc, but you don't need to rely on the aromatics as being the principal source of interest in the wine. There are other things as well. Um, 
texture I've talked about uh, from a variety of different sources. And then, um, yeah, complexity. I just, uh, I, I put a explanation point after complexity because um, I, I, I don't know, I, I, maybe we take whiteboard over granted or maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I think uh, really what, in white Bordeaux, after white Burgundy, we're in the presence of the, the greatest white wine in France. I mean, with, you know, with apologies to conjure you perhaps, um, I think we're talking about everything that makes great white wine. Um, balance, length, concentration, intensity of flavor. Uh, you can age the wines and they'll improve. Obviously it depends how high a quality example you get, but they will improve as the oak integrates and um, the flavors develop more complexity. Um, and just that long, interesting finish, a combination of fruit and oak and mineral and spice notes. These are just complex wines. Um, uh, and even that's what I was so pleased with when I opened my 22 or $23 bottle last night. And for that price, you're getting actually quite a lot of wine. So um, Rodolfo is also commenting on that uh, and saying, um, in white border remains woefully misunderstood, at least in the US market. Um, I think one of the reasons, uh, Rodolfo, is that uh, while um, red Bordeaux, people understand the concept, um, it's a dry, it's a full bodied dry red wine. I think people don't know what the varieties might be in white Bordeaux. Um, I think that if you write Sauvignon Blanc on the label, then people think they might get New Zealand style. I think it's just, uh, it just has a struggle to define itself in the marketplace. Um, also, I think the, can be a risk of sort of having uh, a big hole in the middle of the market. So you get the very premium examples of the Grand Cru Class A's, and then you have the sort of, uh, you know, $10 uh, kind of wines that you drink on planes in economy, you know, and not much in between. But I think that there is plenty in between. I just think it has to find its way through to the marketplace. Um, and I think, you know, very basically, if you say Burgundy, then some people are gonna say, oh, you mean white Burgundy or you mean red Burgundy? But if you say Bordeaux, Bordeaux is a synonym for dry French red wine, you know? And so when you say Bordeaux, no one thinks about white wine. It's just a, a sort of intellectual gap. Um, yeah, different soils, uh, Anthony. I think uh, in the best parks of, of Pessac Le uh, you want to plant Sauvignon Blanc on gravel if you have it. Um, uh, there's a great diversity of soils, um, but uh, the best parts, unsurprisingly, Sauvignon Blanc like similar soils to, uh, to Cabernet Sauvignon not surprising they're related varieties. Um, Marlborough in New Zealand, for instance, gravel soils, uh, like a, a riverbed. Um, um, but yeah, of course, many a great variety of soils in Bordeaux, a lot of clay as well. Uh, that's much more uh, predominant on the right bank, but also in large parts of the left bank as well. So um, Sauvignon Blanc will grow anywhere, whether it will make wines of such distinction on clay, maybe that's an open question. Um, TJ is saying that his, uh, TJ is actually making a great point. I shouldn't get distracted because we probably have to move on, but the, um, the uh, he's got a wine from Continac, Chateau Continac Brown, which as some of you know is in the Margot appellation. Um, so really a red wine, Chateau, but like many uh, properties in the Medoc, um, they have in recent years developed um, a white wine. Um, and now I would even go so far as saying, maybe, maybe even, a majority of Grand Cru Classe white uh, red wines in the uh, in the Medoc have a white wine as well. Uh, a very tiny percentage of production may not always be made in the same vineyard either. Um, for example, take um, Chateau Cos d'Estournel. You you have Cos, Cos d'Estournel Blanc it costs a hundred dollars. It's expensive, but the vineyard is not where Chateau Cos d'Estournel is in Santa Estef. It's way up north in the Medoc close to the Atlantic. But in the case of Contenac Brown or Talbo in Saint-Julien, obviously Chateau Margaux, then the vineyards are right there, yeah. But increasing numbers of Medoc white wines. Um, Jessica thinks that Alsace Pinot Gris is uh, France's second best white wine after Burgundy. What do you guys think? Do you agree with her assessment? No. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Jessica, that's not what she said, but uh, she's making a claim that Alsace Pinot Gris can be a great white wine from France. And I would say probably Riesling from Alsace might have a greater claim, um, but yeah, sure, those varieties are great, but I would still say that Bordeaux, uh, white Bordeaux can achieve degrees of complexity that uh, 
Yeah, maybe Alsace can, but I think uh, Bordeaux is certainly a style, at least in market terms, which is more appreciable by more people than those uh, Alsatian styles, which are a bit more of a um, connoisseur's choice. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> Jessica is still holding up her, her candle for uh, Pinot Gris. Uh, Rodolfo agrees that Riesling from Alsace is a contender for a great French white wine, for sure. Um, a white hermitage as well, Toothier is commenting. I agree with the white hermitage call, just a tiny, tiny appellation. I mean, tiny for red wine as well, but given that so much percentage of that mountain is, is uh, laid over to red wines, that's quite hard to find white hermitage, much easier to find uh, white Bordeaux. Dennis is saying Loire, Chenin Blanc, um, sure. Uh, I take your point, but again, it's a connoisseur's choice, isn't it? I love Loire Chenin Blanc, I'm sure you guys too, too as well, but try selling those wines very, uh, very difficult, again, because of the slightly strange profile of the variety, the intense acidity, the um, uncertainty about whether the wine's going to be dry or sweet, all that kind of thing. Um, okay, so um, any other comments about Bordeaux? I feel like we're getting sidetracked by my provocative comment about the status of French white wines, which I did not mean to inflame discussion. And please don't tell any of my Alsatian winemaker friends that I like white Bordeaux more than their wines. I don't really. I love all French white wines equally. Okay, um, so um, why don't we uh, move then to um, uh, countries beyond France? and uh, take a look at our first example from outside Europe and we'll go to New Zealand. So please take this opportunity to pour your New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Jessica just commenting that the point about the aromatic focus in Loire over the more subtle Bordeaux um, is well illustrated, at least in Jessica's wines. I mean it's just another way of phrasing the same question. I often talk, I often uh, when I get people to try and think about the style of the wine, I often ask them questions like, what's the, what's the purpose of the wine? What's the character or the personality? What's the wine trying to be? And I think that Loire Sauvignon Blanc is really trying to be a crisp, aromatic wine. Well, I don't really think that about white Bordeaux. I think it's, meant, it's trying to be, um, I don't think the focal point is so much on those features. I think it's more on the body and the texture and the overall uh, richness, but balanced by the acidity. Um, so sometimes I think using phrases like focal point, what's the focal point of the wine, can be helpful in sort of focusing your attention on those things which stand out most about the wine. Because they stand out to most people like you and me who think a lot about wine, then they're also going to be the features which are picked up by the consumer as well. Um, and that goes to the heart of what the wine style is. Okay. So let me pour my New Zealand Sauvignon. I'm actually very pleased to have uh, this uh, this wine here, Dog Point, which um, to my mind is really one of the best producers of uh, New Zealand Sauvignon, making uh, complex uh, expressions. Um, again, I opened this last night and I thought it was delicious. Okay, tell me about aromas and flavors in your uh, in your wines, and also tell me which uh, region of uh, New Zealand um, uh, they come from. I assume most of you will be in Marlborough, but please tell me if otherwise. I'm in Marlborough. Um, most of you will be under screw cap as well. I'm under screw cap, and I do get a little bit of reduction. Um, we were talking about reduction in the Chardonnay class um, a couple of weeks ago and uh, I certainly get a little bit of uh, reduction here as well. Um, okay, Michelle is saying uh, pungent, pungent, I love the word pungent, um, sort of in your face uh, aromas, almost like pungent, like punch, you know, almost punching you in the face. Passion fruit, pink grapefruit, good, very nice notes. And Corey, uh, tropical fruit, very, very high acidity, interesting. I didn't know whether we were in the ballpark of very high acidity even for Loire, so. What do you guys think about that? Would you agree with very high acidity? Pronounced aromatics and a touch of uh, grassy notes. Um, okay, Cloudy Bay uh, for TJ. Um, light spritz, so spritz, so a, a tiny little bubbles in TJ's glass. Um, see whether any of you guys have that. 
why might a winemaker choose to leave a little bit of dissolved carbon dioxide in their uh, example of um, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? Um, I believe the reason is that um, it can add additional freshness to the wine. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Jessica and Rodolfo commenting on that. So even though, of course, in the presence of any so, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, then we have a lot of acidity, but if you want to exaggerate that even more to give it a very vibrant wine, um, then you can leave a little bit of dissolved carbon dioxide, which in my opinion as well, and again, I don't know the science behind this, but it also seems to lift the aromatics even more when there's a little bit of dissolved CO2, the aromatics seem to burst out even more. Um, Maria, passion fruit and gooseberries. Good, sounds very classic. Almost exactly the same description as Jessica gives. Uh, Neil um, is saying uh, uh, grapefruit uh, and gooseberry, but not as, as many as some are. Tropical, lemon curd, slight reduction and some yeastiness, good. Um, Tufi, um, sanctuary um, is the name of the wine. Tropical, passion fruit, peach, guava, pungency, crisp, good. Um, okay, Abigail is making a point that um, when she tries the Sancerre after the Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, the Loire version feels flat almost. Interesting comment. Uh, maybe that was a comment about the uh, dissolved CO2, uh, but also could be a comment on the overall vibrancy of the wine, which might be the acidity. Maybe like Corey was saying, you get even higher acidity in um, the New Zealand example than the uh, Loire example. Maria is um, asking, is high toned appropriate? Absolutely. These are absolutely the very definition of high toned uh, aromas. Uh, in um, sorry, uh, in uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, high toned is a classic uh, description, I think, for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc aromas that just seem to kind of burst out the glass. Dennis, uh, more fruit driven, um, aromatic, no mineral tones, um, only a touch grassy, stone fruit, citrus, blossom. Um, uh, Jessica is making the point that she picks up the very defined acid structure of Sauvignon Blanc that I was talking about at the top, about the spherical acidity, like a sphere or like a ring around the edge of the mouth. It's like a circle. Like, so I'm saying like a sphere, like a, a spherical acidity. You feel the acidity around the edge of the mouth. Uh, Jessica is commenting that she gets that strongly in her example of Marlborough. Let me just see whether I get it in my example of Marlborough. Yeah, very much, very much, very, very, uh, yes, see, it's very focused around the edges of the mouth. Um, Vidya, medium bodies, some reduction, pungent, aromatic, orange blossom. So uh, also interesting to get some floral notes. Some of you guys are mentioning blossom or other floral notes uh, in New Zealand. Very good. Um, Rodolfo is saying, um, there could be a little bit of residual sugar in his wine. Um, you pick up the residual sugar on the very tip of your tongue at the front, um, a little bit of surprising sweetness. Many examples of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, especially commercial examples, have got a little bit of uh, residual sugar, um, not only obviously to give it a slight sense of sweetness of fruit, but also I believe to give a bit more mid palate uh, concentration or sense of body just adds a little bit of weight there on the tongue um, for what can sometimes be a bit of a flimsy wine. Um, Jessica comparing the spherical acidity to like a like a halo. You see, Jessica is the is the poet in the room, not me. I love that, a halo. Uh, luminous and tart acidity. Um, uh, Anthony is commenting that he opened his wine three days ago and the fruit aromatics have diminished since then but the complexity of minerality, almost like petrol, has increased. Um, and the age has also rounded out the body. Maybe, Anthony, when you say it's rounded out the body, perhaps means that the, the fruit and the acidity are a bit more integrated now than they were at the beginning, when sometimes the acidity can be very aggressive, as we were just talking about. Um, the tooth is asking, could the reduction aromas, again, so reduction, these um, sort of uh, struck match flinty notes um, in white wines caused by the absence of oxygen. 
um, Chief is asking, could that be caused by thiols, the kind of um, aromatic compounds, which he says are also sulfur compounds. I'm, I think there's um, likely an overlap between that and then between uh, reduction caused naturally in the winemaking process, um, both as the wine is aged in stainless steel, but also under screw cap. Um, I think it's not an either or. I think you can probably have both. So good comment, Tufi. Um, okay, um, let me just see what we have here on this slide. Any points that we need to address? So first of all, I do think that we are moving away from the sort of uh, monochromatic vision of Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand, which is just to be a sort of fruit spectacular, fruit salad, tropical fruit salad thing that we certainly had maybe in the first decade of the 21st century, when I think the Sauvignon Blanc boom really hit um, the US especially, but other international markets as well. Um, people are now experimenting a little bit more. I think the reduction that we're talking about um, is adds a note of complexity. Um, so that's one winemaking tool. Um, if, as we were just saying, that comes from the aging or under the, the screw cap bottling, then that's one winemaking tool that can add complexity. Uh, other tools that can do that, we just talked about, we mentioned residual sugar. We've talked about lees quite a lot, aging on the, on the yeast cells. And then uh, also we can see some oaked versions um, as well. I don't know whether, uh, Anthony, you've got the Grey Whacker. I don't know whether you have the um, oaked version of that or not, but I know that producer makes an oaked version. Um, so more like the, the Bordeaux style than the Sancerre style. Um, so these are just different ways of um, winemakers experimenting to add additional um, complexities to their lineups. Now, what I would say is that I think that in the lineup of most New Zealand um, producers, they do have a sort of what you could call a standard issue fruit driven wine and then if they do these experiments um, with oak and other things um, then maybe that's a higher price point um, but it doesn't displace um, the sort of uh, cash crop for them which is uh, you know the traditional Marlborough fruity style. And let's see here what I wrote for New Zealand quality is again unchanged from uh, previous sessions moderate alcohols and body weights I think we can agree with that um, this to me if you want to say depends on the wine that you have but it could be that your wine here is lighter than your Loire example it could be um, at the very least light to medium bodied I think for uh, New Zealand fruit first yeah I mean you know this, these are the aromas I'm talking about the abundant uh, fruity often tropical aromas that you get from New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc um, the, comp uh, the complicating factors of things like oak and reduction um, maybe um, are what is tempering that a little bit in some examples, but I still think the majority, the predominant style of New Zealand is to have the emphasis on that uh, fruit expression, uh, both aromatically and on the palate. Clarity and precision of flavor. Yeah, I think we can see that in spades in Sauvignon Blanc. Um, not only is there abundant fruit, but almost you, you can detect the individual flavors of each of each fruit. Whether or not you can put a name to what that fruit is, I mean, that's not the point. The point is that there's one flavor here and one here and one here. Uh, they're all very clearly and precisely delineated. I think that's a very uh, typical um, New Zealand uh, style, whether in Sauvignon Blanc or the same thing you get in Pinot Noir as well. Um, okay. Uh, Jessica is commenting that her New Zealand um, is lighter bodied than the Loire. Again, there's some, of course, there's elements to do with yields and concentration and things like that. But um, uh, yeah, I agree, Jessica, it can be lighter than Loire. Um, TJ is asking, Marlborough could be subdivided into more appellations. I think that would be a great step. I mean, it seems like it's one of the world's great terroirs for uh, Sauvignon Blanc, this brilliant expression of fruitiness. Um, combined with the light to medium body and the crispness of the acidity. I think it's wonderful, a, a perfect recipe for that. Sauvignon Blanc. It can seem apparently to produce this style quite effortlessly. So if the terroir is that good for Sauvignon Blanc, I, I'm sure that it could easily withstand um, subdivision into, uh, into more uh, specific regions, which would uh, elevate the region and the prices for the producers. So I'm sure they'll go down that route. Um, uh, Anthony's talking about serving temperatures um, for Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, 
certainly this is a wine I'd much rather have served too cold than too warm. I'm, what I usually do is Sauvignon Blanc, just pour it right out the fridge and then just let it warm up in the glass. Uh, usually in examples like this, or perhaps in the Loire as well, um, there's so much emphasis on the aromatics that even at very cool temperatures, those are going to emerge. And then as the wine warms up, then um, uh, it'll do so even more. I, I think in uh, Bordeaux examples, being a more full-bodied wine, um, you know, more akin to white burgundy, then I wouldn't want to sort of chill it down so much. I would still like to get the uh, the textural sensations, um, which can get a bit sort of um, paralyzed if the wine is uh, too cold. I would like to have those in full bloom in Bordeaux examples. Um, so that, you know, I would, I would definitely take that out of the fridge, you know, 15 minutes before I want to drink it, if it's a Bordeaux example. But the others, I have no issue serving them right out of the fridge, uh, especially uh, in the summer. Okay, any other comments here? Let's see. Um, so I'm talking about the aromatic, what I call the aromatic spectacular. I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of other wines in the world which have got so much aromatic uh, dimension as uh, Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. Um, you can name other aromatic varieties such as Viognier or Condrieu or whatever, things like that. Um, but there's not many which have got such uh, a primacy and an emphasis on the aromas, um, for sure. And certainly within the world of Sauvignon Blanc, I think we can, you tell me if, you, if your examples do not hold true, but I think compared to Loire, these wines are even more aromatic than the Loire examples we started with. Uh, light body, um, yeah, again, some of you will have a bit more than a light body, but I, I would say that we're much more firmly in the light body category here than we were in the Loire, which I think is interesting. I think that's a key point of uh, distinction. Crisp and bright, yeah. And so even in the um, Sancerre examples, which some people are commenting correctly, I think, um, that they're trending to be a bit more fruity, a bit more New Zealand style, I'm not sure whether they have the absolute clarity of fruit and the precision of flavor as some of those New Zealand examples do. And perhaps they have a bit more body as well. Um, but again, I think that's a very hard distinction to draw between the two of them. And if you are ever in a situation where you're being asked um, which regions this one come from, then I would certainly mention the other one um, just to cover yourself. Um, other regions that you could confuse either New Zealand or Loire with, um, Nupa is asking Chile. Chile to me doesn't have the clarity of, of fruit purity that we have in New Zealand. I get often very uh, herbaceous notes, which are obviously are typical of Sauvignon Blanc, but Chile is also uh, traditionally in both whites and reds, it's got a bit of a green note. So in Sauvignon Blanc from Chile, you're layering green on green. So they can be some of the most herbaceous examples of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and perhaps just lacking the absolutely crisp um, profile of uh, New Zealand as well. Uh, South Africa, I don't know that many South African examples, but um, a bit more body, I think, um, and a, a little less emphasis on the aromatics, a bit more restrained. Uh, remember that South Africa is sort of this one foot in the old world, one foot in Europe, one foot in the new world kind of thing. So a bit more restrained, I think, than New Zealand would be. Um, um, Australian, Australian is certainly the tutti frutti style, um, which tries to compete with New Zealand. Um, but I think maybe a bit warmer, just a warmer climate and giving slightly uh, richer and rounder wines. Not by much, but maybe just a bit more body is really the difference I'm trying to make. Not the absolutely light body of New Zealand, perhaps a bit more weight on the palate. Um, but that again, very, very hard. So don't kill yourself about those kind of very niche uh, distinctions. Um, and Corey's uh, asking a, a question about machine harvesting versus hand harvesting. Um, obviously a complicated question. In general, um, the reason why you would hand harvest any uh, wine is to preserve the integrity of the skins. Um, so that the aroma and flavor compounds don't leach into the juice before you're ready for them to do so. Because uh, if you do that, then you're risking oxidation um, and a slight uh, spoilage of the flavors. This is why um, wines like Champagne are harvested by hand because you wanna preserve the absolute integrity of the purity of those flavors uh, up until the point when you press the grapes. 
um, in um, in the case of Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, certainly, if you go to the Loire Valley, if you don't think that most of the Loire Valley is picked by a machine, you're uh, you're mistaken. Um, you know, obviously, quite high yields in places like the Loire, and I'm sure in New Zealand as well. And uh, sometimes, even if you get a little bit of um, spoilage of the juice, then that, that is going to be counterbalanced by the fact you can get the grapes to the winery faster if you machine harvest and you can press them faster. So maybe the two sort of balance each other out. Um, but certainly, if you um, if you have very sort of brutal machine harvesting, then you are risking uh, obscuring the absolute cl clarity of flavour in um, the grapes. But you know, uh, the flip side of that is there might be some examples, maybe the Bordeaux style, where you're not so worried about absolute purity of flavour. In New Zealand, it might be a big problem, but maybe not so much if you're blending or if you're putting an oak and you think I, I don't need absolute clarity of flavour. So winemakers have got to balance all these different uh, aspects. Um, uh, let's see, Jessica saying that the acid balance is much more tense in New Zealand. Um, and uh, Sancerre has got less acidic energy. And I don't know what you know the comparison is with degree days or what other aspects of temperature you might want to compare between the two regions. But it could be that as France warms up, maybe uh, you know we've got very similar climates, or even quite a cool climate in New Zealand by by comparison. So um, if you're get, getting more acidity or um, more shrill or pronounced acidity in New Zealand, that doesn't necessarily surprise me. Um, so um, someone's asking about Margaret River, which um, brings me to a point that I actually had mentioned on the previous slide, but I didn't comment on, which is. Uh, Australian blended examples, um, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. So the white Bordeaux style, but in Australia, very common in um, the Western part of Australia and Margaret River. Um, these styles, generally speaking, do not have the ambition of the Bordeaux styles. I'm sure there are some winemakers who are making expensive versions of this, Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon in Western Australia. But generally speaking, the most common type is the lighter bodied, um, blend where you are adding a little bit of semillon for body and texture, but generally speaking, this is still a light to medium bodied, fresh, semi aromatic wine. The aroma is diminished a little bit by the presence of the not very aromatic semillon. Um, uh, so, just a bit more texture and body, um, but otherwise, just a nice alternative to a straight semillon blanc or a chardonnay, perhaps a bit more acidity than the chardonnay. Um, thank you for mentioning uh, Australia. Good. Okay, so I um, I don't know how much more we have to say about New Zealand. And in any case, um, we should watch the clock and move on to uh, our final wine, the American um, example. So why don't we all pour that wine? And um, when you're ready, tell me um, the aromas and flavors of your American Sauvignon Blanc, and then also which uh, which region um, which region the wine comes from, because I, again, I think that's going to have quite a big uh, impact. Okay. Seems a pity for me to, to pour out this this dog point. The dog point is delicious wines, uh, delicious uh, Chardonnay um, as well. Uh, really very good producer to look out for if you don't know them. Dog point in Marlborough. Okay, I have a little sip. Um, Okay, so I have got Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc. Michelle making the very um, important and valid point, going back to this thing about machine harvesting or hand harvesting, that there's a manpower issue in uh, New Zealand. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that's much more likely to create a situation in which you're, you really have to harvest by machine because you simply don't have the, uh, the resources the human resources to uh, to harvest by hand and i i think that this is going to be uh, a problem for the next uh, vintage uh, in february or march in uh, new zealand because um, it's a very restrictive country right now in terms of people entering from outside so um, uh, i hope they have enough labor to be able to bring in all their crops if the current situation continues okay so let's look at uh, the usa here we go anthony Matanzas Creek, Alexander Valley, so Sonoma, a cooler part perhaps of Sonoma, was Petion, so a little bit of spritz perhaps in there, um, a little bit of dissolved CO2, 
um, showed big reductive aromas, um, but they're blown off after an hour of opening. I wonder, uh, Anthony, was that under screw cap or was that a cork? Yvonne uh, was also in Sonoma um, with tangerine, apple, apricot, yeasty notes. Um, very good. Um, Michelle's Fumé Blanc is corked, so well, now we know at least that your wine uh, is under cork, not under screw cap, although I'm sorry for you, Michelle. Um, Neil uh, from Napa Valley Tropical, Juniper, Orange Peel, Pineapple, good. Um, Jessica's got a Fumé Blanc, closest to Bordeaux style, she says, and barrel fermented, oak matured, um, vanilla ruling over the fruit. So uh, an obvious imprint of the oak, I think, is what uh, Michelle is saying, uh, Jessica's saying there. Um, Michelle is commenting that the acidity on her wine um, is fresh, but not close to being as high as the French or New Zealand examples. Um, yeah, so Anthony's reduced wine did indeed have a screw cap. I think that's um, often a common combination, not necessarily saying that it's uh, the only reason, but often uh, screw cap wines do seem to have a little bit of reduction on them. Um, Michelle is commenting that her wine appears to have um, more body and alcohol than other examples. Corey is getting stone fruit on uh, his wine. So the last time you mentioned stone fruit, I don't think it was in New Zealand. I think it was in Bordeaux. I think it was, I mentioned that it was quite a common feature that you guys were mentioning in the Bordeaux examples, as opposed to the more kind of citrus aromas of uh, Loire. So stone fruit uh, for Corey. Um, Dennis has got another screw cap version um, from Sonoma Coast um, to the far, the far west uh, part of Sonoma. Um, and he's also finding reduction. It's quite interesting how many of you have got screw caps. Um, traditionally, um, the American consumer does quite like corks, but it's good to see that I think, I like to see um, screw caps on young, bright, aromatic uh, wines designed for early consumption because I think they do such a great job of preserving the freshness. Um, if the wines are intended to age for an extended period, I, you know, I think that's a bit of a different uh, conversation, but it's good to, that in these examples where a screw cap makes so much sense for a wine like a Sauvignon Blanc, that many of these American examples are going that way, just as of course, that virtually 100% of New Zealand wines are now uh, on the screw cap. Uh, TJ has got uh, a Fumé Blanc from Napa Valley, uh, floral. And uh, he says, uh, subtly flinty, some sweet citrus, ripe lemon and orange peel, broader palate. Um, someone else just mentioned broader as well, broader palate than previous wines. Uh, good. Yvonne says, moderate acidity, so not high, just moderate acidity, broader and a rounder texture. Okay, good. So while, while we're doing this, I can see you guys are giving me some style notes. So if you're not already giving me some style notes about your wines, then please do, please do so now. Uh, body, weight, dryness, sweet, savory, aromatic or not, oak, all those things, please uh, discuss. Um, Rodolfo is saying that his example from the Santa Inez Valley is somewhere between uh, New Zealand and Bordeaux, well, I suppose it is geographically in some way, but uh, I think he means in terms of uh, style. So um, I suppose what you mean, Rodolfo, is um, perhaps uh, aromatic, but also with some body and some texture. Um, Anthony is mentioning that the Matanzas Creek from Alexander Valley has, has a sharp attack, um, but finishes more rounded on the ripe fruit uh, notes. Good. Um, Jessica is saying um, the richest wine in the lineup so far with generous alcohol, opulent body. Uh, opulent body, I mean, opulent isn't necessarily a word I always associate with Sauvignon Blanc, I must um, admit. Um, so that's interesting. Um, Neil saying from Napa, ripe, slightly hot alcohol. So Neil's, the alcohol on Neil's wine is 14.8% on the label. Um, and bearing in mind, there can be a variance of 1% or more. So it could be even more than that. It seems quite a lot for a Sauvignon Blanc to me, um, quite a lot. Um, but Neil says, nonetheless, in spite of the, um, the slightly hot alcohol, there's prominent spiky acidity um, balanced by ripeness. So, um, I mean, I do sort of wonder, you have to, 
I, when I see numbers like that for a wine like a Sauvignon Blanc, I think, oh, 15% alcohol and yet high acidity. I wonder whether that acidity is all natural. Um, does it feel natural, Neil, or, or does it feel a bit like there's a lot of ripe fruit and then some, somehow out of nowhere, almost on the finish, this acidity appears? That seems to me to be the effect of when you have an acidified wine. But um, um, maybe not necessarily. Maybe the balance is there um, naturally. Um, Michelle is commenting that her Fumé Blanc uh, is also 14.5%. Um, Yvonne's saying acidulated. I hate the word acidulated. I don't see what's wrong with acidified. Until someone tells me that acidified is not the correct term, I'm going to keep on using acidified. Um, Neil's commenting that the acidity does indeed come up to you on the uh, finish, not on the on the beginning of the wine. So to me, I do I would have my 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 doubts about whether that acidity is entirely natural. Um, Dennis is saying higher in structural characteristics, uh, higher body, half a percent more alcohol, medium body more structure but less clarity good comment from dennis less clarity so we're talking about the new zealand example and perhaps also the uh the loire examples where the fruit is very articulate the aromas are very expressive you can pinpoint each flavor each aroma whereas dennis is saying less clarity uh in the american example um Anthony is commenting that the, uh, his wine has got 13.8% alcohol, um, but he makes the, the very good point. The Puy Fumé was 13.5% uh, uh, for the Puy for the, uh, Fumé. So uh, even in Puy Fumé, quite a lot of alcohol. 13 for Marlborough. I generally find Marlborough to be at 13 and 12 and a half only for Bordeaux. So um, Tupi is asking, could we use higher alcohol levels as something which would point to California Sauvignon Blanc in uh, a blind tasting. Well, I think it wouldn't just be higher alcohol levels. Um, I think it's other elements that people have just mentioned. Um, so let me just see a couple more comments, then I'll try and wrap up um, to show, to sort of give an overall appraisal of the style. Um, Luciana saying, high acidity is a bit disconnected from the ripe fruit, ripe fruit with a sweet finish. Um, Okay, so let me just see what I've got here on the slide. Um, so the first words I wrote on here, I wish I could, frankly, they could be the first words on any of my slides about any country is it's hard to generalize because for instance, in my example, I've got a 12.5% example from Napa Valley, which is clearly just a very early picked wine. You know, so if you're a winemaker and you're, in, you're intent on making a French or a New Zealand style of wine, but from a warmer climate than either of those two places, you can just pick earlier. Um, it could create issues, you know, with the relative balance of the fruit and the acidity, but you can still do that. Uh, I don't think my example saw any oak, um, but in general terms, and I think most of you, most of you guys seem to have experienced this, um, you're going to have riper fruit, simply put, riper fruit in California. We always know that. If you look under USA qualities, um, there's a lot of emphasis here. I'm finding different ways around saying ripe, ripe, ripe. I mean, it's just such a hallmark of American wines. Um, so yeah, so I, this should certainly be the, the, the ripest wine. Even in the examples of um, Bordeaux, which can be a full-bodied variety, a full-bodied style, excuse me, um, with 14% alcohol, perhaps, with some new oak, maybe, lees aging, all those things, it doesn't quite have the same ripeness of fruit, the absolute generosity of fruit. Someone said opulent about their fruit. I don't think all of you will have opulent fruit, but the very fact that that's even possible is really a statement about the, the US climate and the US style. Um, one mistake to avoid um, is getting too hung up about the Fumé Blanc style. The Fumé Blanc style is the most famous style of Sauvignon Blanc from America, um, but it is not the only style. Um, so yes, the Fumé Blanc style does exist. Uh, it's popular among especially some more traditional minded producers trying to make a sort of white Bordeaux style. But um, I do think in general terms, um, there is more and more winemakers wanting to make um, a more New Zealand style Sauvignon Blanc from California, from uh, elsewhere in the US. Why? Well, we can see why. Just look at the market numbers, um, the crazy success of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc style. So. 
Um, if you can cut your costs, you don't have to buy any new oak barrels, all that kind of thing, and you're producing a style that the market wants, then what's not to like? So um, more and more of those styles. Um, I, I also wrote um, in the second bullet point, look for fruit ripeness and acid integration. Perhaps we haven't talked enough about acid integration um, today. I know we talked a little bit about the spherical acid structure and things like that. Generally speaking, in, if you were in the Loire and New Zealand examples, and you could really strongly perceive the acidity around the edge of your mouth, then that's a statement in itself about the acidity not being very integrated. Why? Because usually fruit is on the tongue uh, in the middle of the mouth. And so if acidity is around the edge, then there could be a disconnect between the two. In examples like Bordeaux, the fruit can be a lot richer and there's overall more body and more texture. And so they can reach out to fill all corners of the mouth. So in that case, the acidity can be uh, integrated. In the California examples, again, it depends on the wine making choices, but often you will find that perhaps the acidity is a bit lower, perhaps it's a bit softer, a bit more mellow, but that also, um, the perce that perception can also be influenced by the fact the fruit is riper, so the fruit almost absorbs some of that acidity into itself, so there's less of a disconnect between the acidity and the fruit. The fruit and the acidity are more integrated. Um, I think that's a key style, key aspect of style of uh, the US uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, um, Jessica is saying um, acid integration is absolutely in evidence in at least her Napa Valley example. Um, so Abigail is asking a very fair question, which is why did you choose this order? Because you could say, you could make the argument that New Zealand style tastes cooler than Loire. And then you could even argue, well, maybe the Bordeaux is fuller than some examples of uh, the USA. Well, what I always want to do is I want to stay in the same country so we can compare like with like. So I want to compare Loire with Bordeaux. Um, because if, for instance, in the third bullet point here where I talk about USA qualities, if you're thinking in those terms, France qualities, then it's easy to stay in that framework and then just move between regions. So I want to definitely to pair those two. Absolutely, I could have put the New Zealand first. But what I always try and do is I try and move from drier and less ripe to uh, more fruity and riper. And so even though we can talk about the fact that stylistically New Zealand may not um, be as ripe as Bordeaux, for instance, and maybe uh, even less ripe than Loire, um, in terms of the uh, fruit expression, it's certainly a brighter fruit expression than the more dry, savory uh, France examples and prepares the way for the riper, fruitier US uh, examples. So uh, I remember when um, I was doing my PhD and my I was saying to my uh, PhD supervisor, look, I've written all the chapters of the PhD, but I don't know what order to put them in. Um, she said, well, look, any order is arbitrary you just have to choose the least arbitrary one. And so um, that's what I tried to do today. But if you uh, if you would have put them in a different order, that would be totally fine by me. I don't see any issue with that. Um, uh, Dennis is asking, how do you consider acid integration in a quality assessment? Well, I mean, first of all, I think it, that is uh, it's a great point to discuss in a quality assessment uh, because it's a high level appreciation of the wine. Um, it really uh, it shows that you're thinking deeply about what makes the wine what it is. Um, and so I think in a way, it's an aspect of balance. Another way of putting it might be that the acidity is out of balance with the fruit or something like that. But um, generally speaking, I think good examples of these wines, even lighter examples, will, sh will show some kind of uh, fruit acid integration. One of the aspects of uh, Marlborough that you can often find is that there's just not enough body for the slightly shrill acidity. Um, so um, how would you consider it in a quality assessment? I think you just note the fact that, um, you know, if there's complete lack of integration or dislocation between acidity and fruit, you could mark the wine down unless you thought that that very demonstrative acidity served a very good purpose in the wine. And in fact, is a virtue in uh, some way. Um, perhaps it delivers a vibrancy to the wine, which you would not wish to see diminished in any way. 
Um, so you can make the argument uh, either way. But generally, I, I think that good wines manage to integrate their acidity quite well. Um, uh, Anthony is commenting that he might be a French snob, but he finds that the French Sauvignon Blancs to be more elegant. Um, it could be, uh, maybe that's a comment about acid integration. Maybe um, it's a comment about the balance of uh, alcohol and fruit concentration and body, things like that. Um, but I don't take a side. I just think it's very interesting to see such contrasting styles across uh, different regions. Anything else we need to comment on here? Um, ripe, round, often oak, I've written lees aging. I think we've done lees to death today, but certainly lees is another tool uh, for an American winemaker to uh, add a little bit of um, complexity in the wines. Um, uh, but yeah, ripe around, I, I mean, the only thing I'd say about the ripe round statement is again, there are many examples where winemakers are trying to make the New Zealand style. So, but just look for that underlying all that, the, um, the absolute ripeness of the fruit. That's going to be a big, a big clue to you. So let's just move on uh, to the final, um, to the final slide. Um, and so we just talked about this first bullet point actually, didn't we, about the integration. Um, so tartar acidity, tartar acidity, um, I do think, and um, if you go and speak to German Riesling producers, they'll often talk about the fact that acidity itself can be ripe. And so sometimes from cool climate examples, um, the acidity can be a little bit tart. Um, it just finishes a bit sour, especially if you have that dislocation between the fruit and the acidity. So that's a key giveaway, I think, for a cool climate. Um, we talked about the integration. Whereas by contrast, from warmer climates, which among which I definitely include Bordeaux, um, rounder, softer styles with better uh, acid integration, perhaps um, a bit more uh, body and texture. Um, and um, the cooler climates, um, you know, the virtue of the cooler climate, which offsets the risk of having that tart acidity, is the absolute clarity of fruit flavor, including that very abundant perfume um, that you can get in New Zealand examples and in Sancerre and Puy Fume as well. So um, that's such a key element of the style in those regions that you may risk having slightly crisp on a good day, tart on a bad day acidity, if it means that that cool climate is gonna yield those expansive uh, perfume notes, um, which so many consumers around the world love. Um, and then warmer climates, on the other hand, another way of addressing the same question is to sort of say that warmer climates are more forgiving. Um, they can conceal more issues you have with the wine <laughs> because you have more um, room to add different components. You can add oak, you can use more lees, you can do blending, all these things. And so if your Sauvignon Blanc wasn't particularly ripe in 2019, then you can you know, use some winemaking techniques to maybe cover that up a little bit. Maybe you include a bit more Sauvignon this year, maybe you include a bit more oak, or maybe you do the opposite, maybe you reduce the oak. In any case, you have options. If you have a very naked Sauvignon Blanc, like in New Zealand, if you have under ripeness or a damp year or a year where the aromatics just don't emerge that well, then uh, you, you kind of had limited options, really. Um, you can't suddenly start blending in semion because that's not the style of the region, you know? Uh, TJ is just asking um, uh, about Chilean examples of Sauvignon Blanc. TJ, I was just commenting that uh, the natural herbaceousness, both of Chilean uh, wine in general and of Sauvignon Blanc means you're laying, layering green on green. So those really can be some of the most herbaceous herbal wines uh, anywhere out there. Um, okay, well, um, uh, any final questions, anyone? Dennis is asking about the uh, leaf uh, virus which caused this uh, this picture that I took here. Um, and he's saying it could be uh, Esca virus of the trunk. Uh, I don't know, actually, Dennis. I, I, this is the kind of thing I used to know when I was studying for the exam three years ago, but uh, Plant science is um, well beyond my area of expertise. So if you guys know, then please uh, please tell us. But uh, Esca seems a good bet. All I remember about Esca is that it's uh, Esca is a very serious fine disease. 
uh, in Burgundy, um, Southern Rhone, Northern Rhone, and in Italy as well, particularly feared by winemakers, not just because it can reduce yields dramatically, but it can cause apoplexy, overnight death um, of the vine. So um, very dangerous disease. Um, Luciana is just commenting that the California Sauvignon Blanc uh, is a bit like um, the Chardonnay from the USA uh, that uh, we had in a previous session. And Luciana, I think that makes a, uh, makes a great comment there because um, I do think that if you're in a restaurant and you've got a bunch of Californian options, then if you want something with a bit of body like a Chardonnay, but you want a bit more acidity, just use a, a Californian Sauvignon Blanc and you'll tick off a lot of boxes. I love that. Um, okay, thanks guys. We will be back for more uh, more fun uh, next week. We'll be back on to uh, red wine then and uh, same time, same place. Uh, thanks for coming. We'll see you then.